Hello folks, Wilful Ninja here bringing you another nerdy video. Um today we are talking about we're we are talking more about D and D classes, particularly those from Xanatar's guides. Now la uh last video I did sorry I just there we go, let's mute that down a bit. Uh, last video I did, we talked about the colleges of the Bard, and how uh, uh, how Xanatar has expanded their repertoire as well as added some really interesting classes. Now, the cleric does not get as many uh, classes, I believe. Let's see, grave. Yeah, it does not get as many. As uh, the bard or the barbarian or actually yeah, the bard or barbarian or warlock, but it still gets some very interesting choices. Now, let's see here. Uh, we have some text. Um, sorry, a quote from some sort of character. I imagine from one of the D and D novels. To become a cleric is to become a messenger of the gods. The power of the divine is great, but it always comes with a tremendous responsibility. Now, that quote is apparently from Rigby, Rigby the Patriarch. So, uh, now let's go on to a bit more of the expanded lore of a cleric. Almost all folk in the world who re uh, revere a deity live their lives without ever being directly touched by the divine being. As such, they can never know what it feels like to be a cleric. Someone who is not only devote, who is a devout worshipper, but also has been invested with the measure of the deity's power. The question has long been debated, does a mortal become a cleric as a consequence of deep devotion to one's deity, thereby attracting the god's favour, or is it a deity who sees the potential in the person and calls that individual into service? Ultimately, the, perhaps the answer doesn't matter. However, clerics come into being, the world needs clerics as much as clerics and deities need each other. If you're playing a cleric character, the following uh, sections offer ways to add detail to your character's history and personality. Now, the three things it talks about is the temple, where you've uh, prayed and you know possibly worked in. Then you have a keepsake, which I'm guessing is from the temple. Yeah, and then you have a secret. Sorry, folks, if I take pauses, I have a cup of tea. Because of the cold weather, um, I don't know if it's my allergies or it's because of the severe cold weather, and we are, we do have a three-day blizzard warning currently on, uh, on the move. So, uh, please excuse me. When it comes to you know some noises that are clearly my nose being blocked or me taking sips from tea. Now, oh. so let's move on. We'll first read about the temple. Now I like this bit. Most clerics live their service as priests in, a, in an order that la then later realize they have been blessed by their gods with the, with the qualities needed to become a cleric. Now, so that means there are priests. That is a very clear distinction. And again, it brought it pushes more on what I believe to be the main concept between clerics and paladins. See, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it was this way in the past editions. But a lot of people view clerics as the priests of a temple. And then a paladin is either like the, the temple's guard or whatever like I don't see it as such I honestly don't for me clerics are now the armored warriors the, the holy warriors of the temple and this just proved it to me this, this this more pushes in that line because a paladin doesn't have to worship their deity you know they just have to swear an oath. Now, a lot of DMs and a lot of players still have paladins being like uh, religious knights. I don't see paladins as religious knights. I see paladins as more like traditional knights, sort sort of like the chevalier, 
from the fire the fire archetype. I see paladins as that. Yes, they are. They do have some divine magic, but their real power comes from their oath. But anyway, uh, do, 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 do. I've been blessed by the gods. The qualities needed to become a cleric. Prepare for this new duty. Candidates typically res receive training from a cleric of a temple or another place of study devoted to their deity. Some temples are cut off from the world so that their occupants can focus on their on devotions. While other temples open their doors to minister to heal ma um, the masses. What is noteworthy about a temple you study that? So here's six options. Again, as traditional with these extra tables for role playing purposes, uh, you have um, six options. You could either roll ra a d6 for randomly selection, or you can pick one. So, uh, your temple. Uh, your temple is said to be the oldest surviving structure to build, uh, built to honor your god. Could be fun. Acolytes of several like-minded deities all received instruction together in your temple. You come from a temple famed for the brewery it operates. Some say you smell like one of its ales. Your temple is a fortress providing gr an approving ground and trains warrior priests. Your temple is a peaceful, humble place filled with vegetable gardens and simple priests. You served in in a temple in the outer plains. All very good, all very interesting. Especially the outer plains, because that could mean that you actually been to the plane that your deity uh, is. Now, uh, I, I saw a post, I think it was from Nerdarchy, or that talked about how one DM, he, he created his own pantheon, and he felt like one of his deities, a uh, war god or goddess, didn't feel like she wouldn't have a temple. Instead, she has an arena, and in order to become her champion, like she always, she always has a champion apparently, and in order to prove your worth to her, you have to fight in her arena. So yeah, this I like this one. Like again, the temple, each temple is very unique, can lead to very interesting role playing, and it could allow your DM to do stuff later on. You know. Now you have a keepsake. Now your keepsake is a reminder to some lot. It could be a uh, that symbolize your fate and remind them of their vows, or otherwise help them to keep them on the chosen paths. Even though such an item is not Im imbued with divine power, it is vitally important to its owner because of what it represents. There's a finger bone of a saint, a metal bound book that tells tells how to hunt and destroy infernal creatures, a pig whistle that reminds you of your humble and beloved mentor. A braid of a hair woven from the tail of a unicorn. A scroll that describes how best to rid the world of necromancers. Uh, a rune stone said to be blessed by your god. And again, all interesting. And again, as a DM, I could have some real fun with it. Uh, like, for example, the scroll that describes how to best rid the world of necromancers. I could, I would give the person uh, advantage on when the, the, when the player tries to recall information regarding necromancers. I would actually give them advantage. Um, I'll give them advantage so that they could, you know, say about recalling that information. Now, you have a secret. Now, this can be very interesting. Now, let's see here. In terms of secrets, an imp offers you counsel. You try to ignore the creature, but sometimes its advice is helpful. You believe that in the final analysis, the gods are nothing more than ultra-powerful moral creatures. You acknowledge the power of the gods, but you think that most events are depicted by pure chance. Even though you can work divine magic, you have, nearly, you have never truly felt the presence of the divine essence within you. You are plagued by nightmares that you believe are sent by your god as punishment for some unknown transgression. In times of despair, you feel that you are but a plaything of the gods, and you resent their remoteness. Again, very interesting things, and they can all lead to creating like a really interesting character. To, um, like, wow. 
Like, I like how there is none of that, like, you don't, I like how all of them will keep in line with the concept of, you know they're powerful. And that's why they're worshipped. Like, even the one where you believe that they're just ultra-powerful mortals, you don't, um, you know, mess with them. You just, you know, you just keep on going. Now, there is a sidebar, folks. That's what it says. It's titled, Serving a Pantheon, Philosophy, or Force. A typically cleric is an ordained servant of a particular god and chooses divine uh, and chooses a divine domain associated with that deity. A cleric's, cleric's magic flows from the gods or the god's sacred realm, and often a cleric bears a holy symbol that represents that divinity. Some clerics, especially in the world of Emberon, serve a, a whole pantheon rather than a single deity. In certain campaigns, a cleric might instead serve a cosmic force such as life or death, a philosophy or concept such as love and peace, or one of the nine alignments. Chapter 1 of the Dungeon Master's Guide explores options like these in, in the second gods of your world. Talk to your DM about the divine options available in your campaign. Why are there gods, pantheons, philosophies, or cosmic forces? Whatever being or being or thing your cleric ends up serving, choose a divine domain that is appropriate for it. And if it doesn't uh, have a holy symbol, work with your DM to design one. The cleric's class features often refer to your deity. If you are devoted to a pantheon, cosmic force, or philosophy, your cleric features will work for you as written. Think of the references to a god as a reference to the divine thing you serve that gives you your magic. So even if in the D&D game, if there's no gods in a particular DM's world, that I like how that, that clears up, like, just because there's no gods exactly doesn't mean you don't draw on nothing you know there is some sort of energy that your character draws on and I like that but okay let's get into the domains I believe there's only two domains with this yes there is folks there's the two domains forge and grave each very interesting let's get into it the gods of the forge are patrons of artisans who work with metal, from the humble blacksmith who keeps a village in horseshoes and plough blades, to the mighty elf artisan who, whose diamond-tipped arrows of mitral have felled demon lords. The gods of the forge teach that with patience and hard work, even the most int intractable metal can be transformed from a lump of ore to a beautiful wrought object. Clerics of these deities search for objects lost to the forces of darkness, liberate minds of runly orcs, and uncover rare and wondrous uh, materials necessary to create potent magical items. Followers of these gods take great pride in their work, and they are willing to craft and use heavy armour and powerful weapons to protect them. Deities of this domain include Grand, Rox, Onatar, Modrin, Hephaestus, and uh, Tink. Again, that is a collection of their collection of gods, as uh, similar to what happens in the player's handbook: uh, Celtic, Greek, Roman, you know, etc. Now, you have some new do do uh, domain spells. Now, remember, folks, domain spells do not count towards your spells known, and you always have them prepared. Always. Uh, identify. Uh, Searing Smite at 1st level, at 3rd level Heat Metal and Magic Weapon, at 5th level Elemental Weapon, Protection from Energy, 7th level Fabricate Wall of Fire. At 9th level Animate Objects, Creation. Now folks, some of these spells were added in Xanatar's Guide, so do not worry if you cannot find them in your player's handbook, just buy Xanatar's Guide and you will find the spell. You also get bonus proficiency as a forged domain. You get you get proficiency in heavy armor and smith's tools when you pick this domain. You also have a blessing of the forge at level one. At first level, you gain the ability to imbue magic into a weapon or armor. At the end of a long rest, you can touch one non-magical object that is a suit of armor or a simple or martial weapon. 
Until the end of your next long rest, or until you die, the object becomes magic, granting a plus one bonus to its AC, or plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls on if it's a weapon. Once you use this feature, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. That is helpful, mostly to uh, the concept of, like, especially early levels. Let's face it, early levels, especially like one and around that, like one to five maybe. Plus one gear is not going to be very common. And uh, so you're, not everyone in your party is going to have one. So at least this way, when whoever doesn't have one, you can still you know give them some benefits. Now again, the only problem is you can only do it once. So only one person can benefit. And second level, you have uh, Channel Divinity, Arison's Blessing. You conduct an hour-long ritual that crafts a non-magical item that must include some metal, a simple uh, or martial weapon, a suit of armor, 10 pieces of ammunition, a set of tools, or another metal object. Uh, see chapter 5 for equipment in the player's handbook, for examples. The creation is completed at the end of the hour, coalescing in an unoccupied space of your choice on the surface within 5 feet of you. The thing you create can be something that is worth no more than 100 gold pieces. As part of the rit this ritual, you must lay one out. You must lay out metal, which can include coins with a value equal to its creation. The, uh, the metal intermittently coalesces and transforms into the creation at the ritual's end, magically forming even non-magical parts of the creation. Sorry, non-metal parts of the creation. The metal can create a duplicate of a non-magical item that contains metal, such as a key, if you possess the original during the ritual. Which is again, this is sort of cool. Uh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> Ugh, bless me. Sorry, folks. As I said, I don't know if it's my allergies or if I'm going down with some clouds of the extreme cold weather that we're uh, suffering in Ireland here. Ugh. Okay, uh, sixth level. You have the feature Soul of the Forge. Start at 6th level, your Mastery of the Forge grants you special abilities. You gain resistance to fire damage. And while you're wearing heavy armor, you get a plus 1 bonus to AC. Again, I like how it doesn't even state magical armor. It just says, like, any uh, heavy armor. So if you have, like, plate armor, that's plus 3. That's essentially, instead of getting a, an AC of 18... You're now getting an AC of, I say, plus three play armor that gives you AC of twenty one, plus this that gets you an AC of twenty. Oh god, I'm blanking. Twenty two, and then if you equip a shield, you get an AC of twenty uh, four. There you go, folks. And I don't know if clerics have the shield spell, and if they do, that goes up to that, that can get bumped up to twenty nine. Uh, you do have a spell called Shield of Fate, I believe. Which does bump your AC, so I'm not sure. But basically, you're a Forge the main Cleric tank. 8th uh, level, you have Divine Strike. At 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with the fiery power of the Forge. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, it can cause the attack to deal an extra 1da fire damage to the target. When you reach level 14, the, the extra damage increases to 2da. Now notice that it says weapon attack. So even your bow, even if you have like a bow or whatever, if you're an elf like for example, that's still like very good damage. So, uh, last your last feature is called Saint of the Forge. At level seventeen, your blessed with affinity for fire and metal becomes more powerful. You gain immunity to fire damage. And while wearing heavy armor, you have resistance to bludgeoning, uh, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons. Now, I'm personally not too sure how effective that would be, just due to the fact that around level 17, pretty much nearly every enemy is going to have like a magical weapon. So, I'm not too sure how effective that is. But again, it'd be interesting to find out. Okay, last but not least is the Grave Domain. 
again folks this is a, not a very long video because as I said this only gives you two domains gods of the grave watch over the line between life and death to the, the deities of death and the afterlife are fundament, fundamental uh, parts of the multiverse to desecrate the peace of the dead is an abomination deities of the grave include Calivar, Wejas, the ancestral spirit of the undying court Hades, Anubis and Osiris Followers of these deities seek out, seek to put wandering spirits to rest, destroy undead, and ease the suffering of the dying. Their magic also allows them to stave off death for a time, particularly for a person who still has some great work to accomplish in the world. This is a delay of death, not denial of it, for death will eventually get its due. So yeah, the grave domain is very interesting. It's get it. You're against. Uh, sorry, hold on. <coughs> oh, bless me. You're you're against zombies, necromancers, and the like, but you're also against people dying prematurely, and you will you will extend their life if need be. But. You will not give them immortality. Uh, another deity you could consider to be a grave domain is the Raven Queen. Because she hates uh, vampires and liches. Who seek to like, permanently extend their life. Now I play an interesting necromancer who has the same type of philosophy. He does not wish to extend his life. He purely seeks to serve the Raven Queen. But he understands that if he goes up against a vampire or a necromancer, he's going to be greatly outnumbered. So as such, he decided, because he was part of a cult of Vecna, which was a cult of necromancers, he is going to use the, the magic that they taught him to, against them. So if he so basically, they send undead after him. He will kill the undead and raise them to um, even the odds, or he will uh, go after bandits or people who harm the innocent, and then raise their bodies as uh, punishment, and use them against other evil beings. So, it's again, it's very interesting. Now, your domain spells for the grave domain is. Uh, first level Bane and False Life. Third level Gentle Repose and Ray of Enfeeblement. Fifth level Revivify and Vampiric Touch. Seventh level Blight and Debt Ward. Ninth Anti Life Shell and Ray's Dead. Again, I find it interesting, like, it's a lot of necromantic energy, and again, it's understandable because. You're you're putting so much of your power. Your the main source of your power is in and around debt. So the chronic energy is most likely the energy you're gonna MBA. Now, uh, circle of mortality is your first feature. You gain the ability to manipulate the the line between life and debt. When you would normally roll one or more dice to restore hit points with a spell to a creature of uh, zero hit points, you instead use the highest number possible for each dice. In addition, you learn Spirit of Dying Cantrip, which doesn't count towards the number of cleric cantrips you know. For you, it's a range of 30 feet and you can cast it as a bonus action. I like how this adds more to the healer aspects or like keeping people active in the battlefield aspect of clerics oh someone's uh is is doing their death saving throws boom i'll heal you but it won't be like i won't just heal you for a low amount you're getting the maximum points or if i don't have any spells spare the dying at a range instead of having to touch you very good now you get Eyes of the Grave also at first level. You gain the ability to occasionally sense the presence of the undead, whose existence is an insult to the natural cycle of life. As an action, you can open your awareness to magically detect undead. 
until the end of your next turn, you know the location of any undead within 60 feet of you that isn't behind total cover and that isn't protected by deviation magic. This sense doesn't tell you anything about the creature's capabilities or identity. You can use this feature a, a, not, a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier and you regain all expend uses when you finish a long rest. Because of the amount of ways you cannot uh, use it, I don't know how I feel about it. Because, as I said, it were the total cover. So which means a, uh, a num if there's a certain amount of trees in your way, then yeah, they'll get total cover. If there's like uh, if you if you're in a crypt, you know they will have total cover. So I'm a bit yeah on the eyes of the grave. Um, channel your channel divinity for this class is path of the grave. You can use your channel divinity to mark another creature's life force for termination. As an action, you choose one creature you can see within 30 feet of you, cursing it until the end of your next turn. The next, ter ter next time your ally or yours hits the cursed creature with an attack, the creature is vulnerable to all the attack's damage, and then the curse ends. That is pretty epic, especially if uh, that person scores a critical hit. Uh, a rogue teaming up with uh, a four, sorry, a grave domain cleric can be pretty lethal. Basically, the cleric would curse the target, marking them for termination, and then the rogue will attack. Which, if they're a level three rogue, they would have the assassinate feature, which means any attack they deal is a critical hit. But the thing is, though, they're already taking double damage because of vulnerability. So, yeah. <laughs> that person is most likely going to die. Now again, technically you could accomplish this yourself with a multi-class. But I'd like to think that you would team up with another player. Like maybe uh, one player, maybe you're the Grave Domain Cleric. But, uh, but your rogue, uh, the rogue assassin, is also a worshipper of the same deity. And the, they see their, their job is to assassinate. Like, their job is more directly to target, whereas yours is more... It, it's sort of like the blood hunters and the blood domain clerics in Matt Mercer's... Uh, which is implied in Matt Mercer's Teldori Guide. The blood clerics are the priests and their advisors of the blood hunters and then the blood hunters are the ones that actually go out and hunt I could see that being like a cool combination like every blood cleric has like an assassin sorry every grave domain a cleric has like an, a person who will help carry out the wishes of their deity like the, the cleric is just a guide for these uh, religious warriors again that's just my thoughts on it, like again, I, I feel like it could be a cool dynamic between two players. Uh, Sentinel at Death's Door. At sixth level, you gain the ability to impede Death's prog progress. As a reaction, when you hit, a, when you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you suffers a critical hit, you can turn that hit into a normal hit. Any effects cri triggered by the critical hit are cancelled. So again, if you get hit by a verbal sword, you don't automatically die. You can use this feature equal a uh, number of times equal to your wisdom modifier. Uh, you gain all expend uses when you finish a long rest. Potent spellcast. Starting at eighth level, you add your wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with any cleric cantrip. Last but not least, keeper of souls, level seventeen. You can seize. You can seize a trace of vitality from a parting soul and use it to heal the living. When an enemy you can see with you can see uh, dies within 60 feet of you, you and one creature of your choice that is within 60 feet of you regains hit points equal to the enemy's number of hit dice. You can use this feature o only if you aren't incapacitated. Once you use this feature, you can't do so again until the start of your next turn. That is the Grave Domain Cleric, folks. For my character, if I was to play a cleric, um... I'm still torn between... I'm now actually torn between uh, War 
and grave. Because as I said, with war, there's some cool deities that you can worship. Uh, but there's also really cool uh, things with the grave domain. So I don't know, it would have to be a toss up. If someone was willing to do the rogue thing with me, then I would probably go grave domain. Now, that will probably uh, cinch you for a grave domain. But yeah, folks, that is it. Uh, not long of a video. Uh, next, after Cleric, it is Druid. And then after Druid, that that was Fighter. And we did, uh, then we did Monk. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're definitely going on to Paladin next after Druid, folks, it seems. About time, too, am I right? We've been doing all these, we've been doing all this catch up work with Xanatar's Guides. And now we're finally getting to it. Oh. And hopefully by that time, folks, I'll be much better. I'll try and do the Druid video tomorrow. But if I am coming down with some, I'd probably want to uh, rest. So that way I'm ready for the D&D game that I broadcast every Friday. Um, remember folks, if you liked this video, hit the like button. If you want to comment, comment. I will make sure I reply. And if you want to always be notified of new D&D videos, please subscribe. And this is Wolf Ninja signing out. May the force be with you. And remember, roll for initiative.